questions on this chapter, let's just wait, okay? If nobody has questions on this one, then we could move into the next one. Is that okay? So, again, I cannot review everything. I mean, if I try, I will, be, I will cover half, not even half, okay? So, that's not practical. Uh, we can do these, for example, see? You had this in front of you, you went through them, some of them are very clear, I hope, at least one or two are clear to you, some of them are not. So, questions. Yes, go ahead. And let's try to go in sequence, okay? And we can try, if, they, if needed, we can go back and forth, okay? But let's try to make it, you know, just to make it more efficient. Go. Okay, and number nine. Number nine. So all of the other eight are fine. You have no problem with the first eight. None of you. Yes. Ah, oh, you go. Can <laughs> okay, we wait then? Okay, so for number two, for the micro uh, microbio microbiota microflora, uh -huh. you are going to use like the definition uh, referring to being an organism from a certain uh, organ, or what are you gonna? I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. Like for microbiota. Okay, what about it? Okay. What do you need to know about microbiota? Okay. You need to know what it is. Then you need to know the kind because of interactions. Because I know that it's a microorganism from a particular site or like, no? Microbiota refers to all of the organisms living in and on your body. All of them. All of them that have either permanent or temporary presence in and on your body and that in healthy individuals do not cause a disease. See, some of them are permanent. Some of them are there the whole life. Some of them stay there for certain periods of your time. But again, they don't cause a disease. Now, we know microbiota has the potential to become pathogenic, right? And then what do we call that? Uh, the what? Sorry. Pathogenic. Yeah. What do we call the condition in which, what is the term that we use for a condition in which a normally non-pathogenic organism becomes pathogenic? I can hear you. No, virulence is pathogenic. Is virulence is just a degree of pathogenicity. Then we call it opportunistic or secondary infection. Make sense? No. Huh? So that's when it, that, that's a typical opportunistic infection. Why do we call it opportunistic? because it's gonna happen on, only after certain conditions are there, okay? But normally, they don't cause a disease. Microbiota, is that good enough? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Do you know the, the stages that I'm on is on the prodromal, uh, yeah. uh, do you, you just want to know the definition? You need to know the sequence and the definition. The sequence. The sequence and the definition. <laughs> you need to describe the stages okay. and in the right sequence. Okay. So you, I can say, which of the following best device, when best defines the incubation period? And I can give you four or five statements. Or I can ask you to define incubation. Or I can ask you to put these three or four stages in the right sequence. Okay. Clear enough? Clear enough. And there was another hand in here before. No, no, I know, before her. No? So, we are going through, she has a question or comment, I don't know, on, on number nine. Go ahead. Yes, you need to know them. Yes, we need to know the mechanism. The five mechanism of antimicrobial action. And then you give, you give like examples. Yes. No, you don't. No, you don't. Okay. Yeah, I know, there is a slide on that, but I mentioned these are examples of them. And again, most antimicrobial actions basically work with one by one of these mechanisms. Some of them might work in more than one. And I gave you one or two examples, but no, don't, you don't need to worry about them. Okay. But you need to know the five mechanisms. I can hear you. You want me to repeat it? No, I'm sorry. Those are the five 
Are you asking me which are the five mechanisms? No, I'm telling you. Are you asking me or telling me? Telling you. Okay, go ahead, list the five. Okay, Christopher said prejudice, the wall synthesis, the DNA, and RNA synthesis, and the protein assembly. Uh, those are four. You list the three, okay? You cannot remember the other five. You can't remember the other five, but you have your notes in front of you, right? Yeah, and that is the point. If you have your notes in front of you, that's not a problem, right? Yeah. Um, for Go ahead. Are we done with this five? No. You can see it up here, okay? No, that's okay, I'm serious, because then I have to yell all the way to the back because of just one person that sits way in the back. I'll be with you, I'll be with you, okay? There they are, right here. I'm not gonna leave them there for a few minutes. I need to move on now. Am I yelling too much? <laughs> Excuse me? Today you are. Sorry. But just today? Yeah, just today. Okay, good. That's good. There <laughs> yeah, was another question. Go ahead. You have a question for you, right? Go ahead. Um, on the, I know it's very brief on the bioterrorism. Do we need to know? On the what? The bioterrorism. Do you want us to know category A, B, and C? Yes. Or just, okay. Yes. My question was the same question. For each category, what do you have to know? Just the, the basic groups, that's all. Okay. A, B, and C, that's all. Not like place. Not exactly details on each of them, okay? Yeah. Am I clear? Yeah. Okay, so by back. Go ahead. My question also pertains to that. Okay. Questions? But um, it was just because I'm the very subjective, it asked for the highest, um, the highest double dowry category is correct? Yes. Okay. That's the, that's the highest chances, threat, possibilities of the being developed as bioterrorism. So that's, that's how they are classified as categories. Okay, See, so not the, the categories. See, no, no. You need to know just the basic criteria for classification. Okay. How do you, what do you classify as A without specific type? But what makes an agent to classify it as type A or B or C, right? No, that's fine, that's okay. Is this just so she can hear me, okay? Okay. <laughs> Are we okay then here? You tell me if we need to move on. You direct this session, not me. I take care of my classes and I direct my classes. I shouldn't, but I do. But you direct this. You tell me. Are we done? We can move to the next one. Yes. Or we need to cover some of this in here. Yes. Anybody, this is your session, not mine. Yes, I proposed this one. I don't know why, but I did. But somebody asked for this. <laughs> yes or no? Sorry, I care about the class. That's, no, you don't care about the class. Come on. I hear every day. Yeah, you care about you. Oh, you mean you? Um, I, 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 say, I thought you meant you care about the group. Oh. Uh, you don't, huh? Nah, 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 you care about you. My point is, this is for you. And I'm, this is going to, for, we are going to focus on what you need, no, not on what I like. So we can move on to the next one. Yes. yes. You all feel confident with all of these objectives? Yes. yes. Good. So what is the next one? Uh, innate, innate, innate and adaptive immunity. Innate and adaptive immunity. This one? Yes. Okay. Again, say. Number seven. Number seven. Before number seven, anybody? Number three. Number three before number three, anyone? No. So number one and two are okay. We don't have any problem with that. Good. Number three, go. What is the question or comment? Uh, so the chemical mediators that orchestrate the Okay. Are you cytokines, chemokines, and colony? Colony stimulating factors. Yeah. What did I say about it? 
And what else did I say? If you remember anything. Okay. What do you remember that I said about? You don't remember nothing, but I said nothing. I didn't say that. I'm asking you what is there to say. <laughs> Go ahead. You raise your hand, buddy. I said that there are so many chemicals involved in this that you don't need to worry about it. I think you said it right. So there are so many of them. We have tens of chemicals. And it's really interesting. It's really, really interesting. Okay? Like, for example, aspirin, this drug, this acetyl salicylic acid, has been in the market a few years ago. It had its 100th year wow. of being in the market. Originally, uh, uh, over 100 years been, been in the market for medical purposes. And just recently, maybe around 20 years ago, some of the actual mechanisms of aspirin have been understood. So what is that telling you? The lots of chemicals, drugs, medications are used without really knowing how they work, and even if they work sometimes. My point being, one of the main effects of aspirin you now know is recommended that people over 50 with degree, with some risk of heart disease to take one aspirin every day. You know, you heard that, right? What is the reason? What? How would that help? Is that? It's an anticoagulant. More specifically, we will see this on the next chapter. Actually, it's not coagulation, but that's an acceptable term. It's not 100% correct. But it's about platelets. It's about platelets. Aspirin decreases the platelet aggregation. And for many years, it was thought that it was just binding to it, by blocking a protein that connects the two pla the platelets. Now we know actually aspirin. It also blocks the, uh, the uh, synthesis of certain chemicals that are important in the inflammatory process. And inflammation favors coagulation also. So aspirin works more than one way. Closing this up. This is a long list of chemicals, and I told you, you don't need to worry about them individually. I'm not going to ask you names on this. It would be really interesting, but we need a lot of time. So we would just need now, like, chemokines? That's all. Is that okay? Is that clear? Yeah. Okay, good. When I say it's okay, if it is clear for you, okay? So, any other question or comment? Number five, it applies to the sequence. And you may ask him, you may ask, why did I put these objectives? Yeah. No, actually, I don't have to. See, I, this is the first time I use this book. And, and I tried to use the book for you because you use that book. I mean, I have my notes. I have had my notes for 20 years. But I'm making notes now because I want the notes to reflect the book that you spend your money on. So I, to me, it's unfair to ask you for a book and then give, me, give you my notes. I mean, that's unfair to me, in my opinion. And then I get very ambitious. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm going to explain this. And then I said, no, that's not the case. That was the reason. So that was my mistake. OK, any other questions? So, but yes, that's the same thing. Don't even worry about it. Okay. Is that clear enough? Yes. OK, go, question. Well, in the notes, you're up there in the notes, there's no the notes are just listed, so I don't and know I'm, how it yeah. gets. And I went through this briefly, okay? I said, this is interesting because we have now innate, meaning what? You are born with them, right? Yeah. This first and second line of defense, mm -hmm. which by definition, again, definition are perfect, but I mean, classifications are not perfect, but first and second line, we define them as non-specific, mm -hmm. right? Remember that? Yeah. Only the third line is specific, the one, the immune system itself, B and T cells and so on. This is kind of in the middle. Is good enough to recognize 
certain molecular patterns. They are called, you know, what are they called, PAs and PAs? Pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Would that be important to recognize? Yes or no? Yeah. Do you see the analogy here? So if your body is being continuously exposed to certain bacteria or viruses or fungi or whatever pathogen is, again, the recognition is not at the cellular level. The recognition is the molecular level, isn't it? Yes, we recognize antigens, which are molecules. But in this case, it's not even at that level, but it's grouping. See, you may, see, I think of an analogy, but I can be kind of offensive, so. But it, that the analogy comes right away to me, okay? Nobody will get offended. Excuse me? Nobody gets offended, just say it. Really? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna give you a name if there's you know, okay. Absolutely. <laughs> if you're walk, walking through a non-familiar neighborhood, Okay, something you're, you're, some area that you are not familiar with. Okay, there is nobody there. It's getting dark, and then somebody comes on the opposite direction. Aren't there some signs that you're gonna recognize are potentially dangerous? Yes. Yeah. And you may be wrong, or you might be right. Yes or no? <laughs> Do you follow what I'm saying? So. These cells, and I'm talking about macrophages mainly, okay? Mainly macrophages, but also neutrophils, also natural killer cells, okay? They are able to recognize these signs that says maybe this is a problem. But it's not 100% specific. It doesn't recognize, oh, this is poliovirus, or this is tetanus, or this is whatever. But it's grouping, and that's what we call it, right? This is what we recognize. I don't want you to describe, I'm not gonna ask you to describe what is it that you recognize as potentially dangerous in this person coming towards you in that, in that condition, right? But you have an idea already, right? That's the idea, but you don't need to know the details on that. I briefly mentioned this. This is the most common receptors. You know what toll means? What does it mean? This is in It's like a checkpoint. And that's English, isn't it? To me, it doesn't make any sense. But I don't speak English, so that should make sense to you, I guess. But that is the point. This is, is a, I don't want to use the word specific, but is selective enough that identifies what? molecular patterns which are frequently associated with pathogens, common pathogens or potentially pathogens in your area, the ones you're in contact with. So this is going to be different in different parts of the world, different environments, okay? But this is molecular. This works both at the, the species level as humans, evolution through millions of years, and it also happens, it also changes, it also occurs at the individual level, okay? That's it, you don't need to know more details than that, okay? Just the, 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 this ability to recognize common molecular patterns associated with potential pathogenicity. That's it. Again, one more thing. I wanted to explain this in a lot of detail when I was planning my class and then it doesn't work. Questions, comments, we can keep going, you can come back or whatever you want. So, uh, yes. Is that okay? Thank you. My question is going to be further down in the chapter. Is that okay to be still going on? We are going in order. So we went through number four or five, right? So there is no question here, no question here, no question here, no question here. There you go. Well, that's what I'm asking. Go. Oh, number nine. On the what? Number nine. Number nine. So there is no question in five, six, seven, and eight. There you go. Seven. Seven. What is the question there? I think the objective is beautiful here. See, it's so clear. Now, what is the question? Are you, 
you want to go or, or you want whatever you want to do. I don't know what is the need to come to the field. Okay, first, what is it? What is it? Oh, that was your question? What is it? What is it? You don't know? Okay. The Grajeda, what is, no, no, not what is that. The whole, that's the second question. What do you mean? What is it? Let me see. There's two questions. What are they here? The molecular protein that outlines it on the outside of the cell. Did you hear that? No. No. You don't need to say molecular protein. There are, there, there are proteins that coat our cells. There's two types. And they coat our cells and they allow other cells of our immune system to be able to differentiate between our cells. It's like, I'll give you an example. If, if, uh, if you walked into my class, okay, and everybody's wearing an orange Redoso cap, Okay. Everybody in there is wearing an orange cap, okay? And some people aren't. You would be able to tell who was from my class based on my orange hat that everybody else in that case, that is the marker. So this would be the major histocompatibility compatibility complex. Simple. <coughs> it's a protein. It's a group of proteins. What are proteins made of? So these are sequence of amino acids. Proteins are coded for by genes. So we have MHC gene and MHC proteins. What is ours? It's yours and hers and mine. And we have six of these. You don't need to recognize me when I say this. And they are and they are actually found in chromosome six. And you don't need to know that either. But we know where they are. Two questions about the MHC. One, what is it? Two, what it does. So the C stands for complex. It's telling you it's more than one. Right? More than one what? You can talk about genes or proteins, because we use the same terminology for both. We can say MHC genes and MHC complex, I mean proteins. What does the H mean? Histocompatibility. If it's compatible with tissues. If it, tissues are compatible. What are tissues made of? Cells. <laughs> Aren't they? Cells have a membrane, right? A phospholipid bilayer with cholesterol and proteins. All membranes are made of phospholipid bilayer and proteins. The type and the amount of proteins will vary depending on the kind of membrane. But the plasma membrane of our cells have a group of proteins which are very unique to us. So these genes in chromosome six, A, B, C, D, P, D, Q, D, R, by transcription and translation, result in the synthesis of a specific proteins. And you have your version of them, and you have your version of them, and I have my version of them. Because this is genetically determined, right? And because we have so many different possible combinations, the chances that at random two unrelated individuals will end up with the same combination is really, really, really low. Am I confusing you now? No. So what is it? Either you're going to talk about the genes or the proteins, right? But in your cells, you have the proteins and the surface. You know, when I used to go to the store a long, long time ago, the cashiers had to enter each price for each item, right? Now that you don't have to do this, right? You just scan it. What are they at scanning? A barcode. So the manager or somebody in the stores, and I think they do it every day, they go through the whole list 
and then they assign a barcode. And even two very similar items, like two different size uh, boxes of the same material, or two different colors. You know how many cereals are there now, right? Or crackers. In my time, there were crackers, that's it. Now they have low salt, high salt, no salt, and all of these other varieties, right? Each one has some specific barcode, even if the price is the same. So your cells have their unique barcode. All of your nucleated cells have MHC1. Lymphocytes and macrophages have MHC2. Is that good enough? What it is, what is the importance of it? What is the significance of it? Do you know like the word significance? Should I change that word? See? I'm not going to say anything else, okay? You don't know. Okay, it's over now? Should we leave now? Okay, go ahead. Why do I have to ask again? So. What are the differences between C and B cells? Oh, ooh, I can ask anyone about right? Because <laughs> I told you in class, and I said, didn't I suggest, recommend, start two columns, didn't I? And almost every single time I mentioned a difference, I said, go back and add this to your column. Didn't I do that? Yes. Okay, what is the question? <laughs> <laughs> you want to listen? Yeah. You want to give me 10 differences? Well, at least some. At least some? Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. That's not a difference, but that's a good characteristic. That's important so you don't get confused, right? Both are made in the bone marrow. Okay, but the T cells mature in the bone marrow, but the T cells mature in the thymus. So the site of maturation is different. Thymus for the T cell, bone marrow for the B cell. Go. So the plasma cells will turn into, no, the B cells will turn into plasma cells. And the other one will be the cell-mediated um, so, cells. So, B cells are primarily responsible of humoral immune response. Mm -hmm. T cells are primarily responsible of cell-mediated immunity. And I keep saying this again and again, classifications are not perfect. We divide the immune response into humoral and cell-mediated, and even that's kind of artificial because what did we say about the H, the T helper cell? It has the effect on both, right, eventually, isn't it? So still, it's not 100%, but it's useful. B cells, humoral immunity, T cells, cell mediated. Go. There's two different types of T cells. At least two different types, T cytotoxic, T helper. B cells, they are all the same. Yeah, but you're talking about T cells now. What you're saying is correct. But that's not part of the question, right? You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, what she's saying is correct, but you are not talking about the question anymore. The question is B versus T cells. And also, um, B cells only like a free antigen or a membrane So the B cell can recognize the anti antigen by itself, either in a free form or bound to a membrane. But the T cell needs what? The, T, the antigen plus MHC. MHC. So the T cell needs double recognition. You are getting bored by this now, right? How many times you repeated this in class? It's boring, isn't it? No, it's not. I feel like in every slide. Yeah. Well, is it a little bit too much then? Okay. Can you come up with three more? Can you come up with three more? <laughs> no! Oh, I should get it, go. Uh, okay. The B cells have faster recognition and T cells take longer. Typically, B cell responses are faster, T cell responses are slower, typically. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a generalization. Mm 
you can say B cells involve antibodies, T cells don't. Okay. Sure you can. Um, all the IC, all the IgA's, IgM's, they all belong in B. Because I had that. So antibodies are what B. Nothing to do with the T. Okay, a T is nothing with antibodies. Yes, you need to know the five antibodies. Yes, you need to identify characteristics of each of them. They, yes, you need to know how they work. You have to know how they work. Not only what they do, but how they do it. Okay? Okay, any more questions? Yes, why? What is the question? To describe this? Yes. Okay. Anybody, any volunteer? Okay. Or you want me to do it? Number 12. I can't, sorry, I'm sorry? Okay. Active means what? Active, okay, there are two concepts here that maybe some of you are a little bit confused and they kind of overlap. Primary and secondary immune response. You distinguish those two. Is that a yes? yes. So I don't need to go over that. What does active mean? Your immune system is working. You are producing the antibodies. You are making the cells. And typically, what produces an active immunity? Exposure to the antigen can be natural. When we call it natural, is a result of a natural event. Artificial is a man-made event. So I can get infected in the community, I can receive a vaccine. Both are examples of active immunity. Active immunity takes time to develop, right? So it's kind of slow, but it's going to be long-term. Why? because we are making memory cells. In passive immunity, I, my immune system is not working. My immune system is receiving immune elements, typically antibodies, but can also be cells already made, right? That's passive. Am I going to develop memory cells there? No, no I'm not, because I'm not being stimulated by the antigen, right? Passive immunity is going to give you immediate protection right away. But since you don't make memory cells, it's going to be very short term. Because of this, primary immune response is slow and relatively weak. Secondary immune response is fast and relatively strong. Right? Natural. natural. Like That's the only example, receiving antibodies in a natural way from the mother. No. No. So we are done with this one? The only difference between MHC1 and MHC2 is between T helper and T cytotoxic. This is not humoral. So MHC has nothing to do with it. The B cell, which is the humoral, right, does not need MHC. The B cell recognizes free or membrane bound antigens by themselves. B cell. T cells need the antigen plus the MHC. But now, 
T helper cells can recognize only MHC2. <coughs> T cytotoxic cells can, can recognize only MHC1. No? I lost you here? No, thank you for clearing it up. Can you repeat that? I can repeat it, of course. <laughs> From the very beginning, so we don't get lost in the, in the details. <coughs> B cells and T cells are <coughs> activated by antigens, right? If they never find the right antigen, they are never activated. They are ready, they are immunocompetent, they are mature, but they are not activated. The antigen activates them. The B cell recognizes and activated by the antigen by itself. Either free antigen, a toxin, a molecule, or an antigen that is part of a membrane. Right? B cells. T cells cannot recognize these antigens by themselves. Actually, the T cells cannot recognize free molecules. For a T cell to recognize an antigen and be activated, this antigen one must be part of a membrane, and two might be next to MHC. Only that way the T cell recognizes the antigen. Right? Now, let's forget about the B cell for a minute. T cells only. Two types of T cells, right? T cytotoxic, T helper. The T cytotoxic CD8 cells can recognize only MHC1, no MHC2. T helper cells or CD4 cells can recognize only MHC2. Is that? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Um, I had a question, so I didn't, Go ahead. I didn't really understand, like, in the book, how, how we went through question seven about the MHC, but then it starts talking about HLH. Okay, I, what and did I say in class? That is the same thing. That is the same thing. Okay. 100% is not the same thing, okay? <laughs> but it's close enough. Let's leave it like that. Okay. It was called HLA, and it's still called HLA because they were first found in the human leukocytes. And that is why they were called that thing. But now we know they are in all those cells. And still used, but probably the most common term is MHC. But use them as synonymous at this point, okay? Next chapter? Next chapter? Okay. Oh, the next one is so easy, isn't it? Don't tell me a question of this. <clears throat> in my opinion, this book, and this is not necessarily a bad thing, okay? But in my opinion, and this is at least the third of the uh, time that I find this, that some chapters overlap. They overlap a lot. Actually, a lot, as we were going into it, you will even see that the same image, the same figure, is in two chapters. So, I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, but it's the wrong, it's, it's just kind of a repetition. It helps to reinforce concepts, but time being a problem, being a challenge, we might have a problem there, okay? So, questions. Of course you need to know, you need to define inflammation. You need to identify the four cardinal signs and explain the pathophysiology of each of them. Okay? You need to identify the events of the cellular and the vascular phase of inflammation. Yes, you have to. You need to understand how is complement activated and what is the result of complement activation. Any questions here? They are there for you to ask. I guess as far as the I can't hear you, I'm sorry. What happens is this. What happens in the vascular phase? Pretty much vasodilation, increased capillary permeability, increased blood flow, heat and redness, leaking, formation of an exudate, right? Swelling and pain. That's it. What is the cellular phase? Increased production of white blood cells, leukocytosis mainly, neutrophils in the acute phase, macrophages and the chronic phase. 
migration of these cells to the site of injury, to the site of inflammation. Diapidesis meaning what? Diapidesis? Moving out of the blood vessel into the actual tissue, and by chemotaxis, go there and do the phagocytosis. You need to know the value of inflammation, right? Question. So, we move to the next one? Yes. See, this is not for you to come and wait for someone else to ask, okay? Yeah, go ahead. How many times do I need to say that? Why don't you ask right away? I don't know. I was looking for a question. Oh, okay. Good. Um, I have a, I'm still having uh, trouble with parenchymal. Parenchy 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 and stroma. Parenchyma and stroma. I did a good job in class, but I still No, but obviously I didn't do a good job. I still don't, don't you say, know. don't say that. Well, I still don't say No, I need right. my reality. I don't need to tell, I don't need to say that I'm good. I don't need that. Okay. Obviously, I didn't do a good job because you didn't understand it. Oh, you don't, so that's my... Actually, you are in that class about the comment that I'm going to make. This student made this comment. Oh, this is like Diana Ross and the Supreme. <laughs> Obviously, the example, I think it was a beautiful example, but it didn't work, really. You know who the Ayana Rose was? Mm -hmm. In the Supreme? Mm -hmm. That's why it did work. <laughs> I'm going to get this comes from the 60s, I think. I don't know. Can you come up with another example on that? Uh, maybe An that, analogy? Maybe Destiny's Child and Beyonce? I don't even know no, who no, that no, is. See, my point being, in her example, in my example, see? I kind of heard about Beyonce. I, don't, I have never seen it. But the, the, what's the other part? Destiny's Child. Is the name of the group or what? Yeah, that was yeah. a group. That See, was I did know that. Hey, that tells you something, right? Tell me about Heather, but for your law, movie Diana Ross, the Supreme movie is from Of course. But this example, this example is not working for her, okay? In the central nervous system, the Supreme movie is from Beyonce. 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 What is what are the two basic 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 functions or capacities of the nervous system? Irritability or excitability, responsiveness, and conductivity, right? I mean neurons do other things. But the main functions, I mean functional capacities of neurons is they respond to stimuli and they can conduct an impulse, right? Who in the nervous system does this function? The neuron. That's the parenchyma. Now, but is the nervous system made only of neurons? No. You have supporting connective tissue. You have blood vessels there. Of course you have blood vessels. You have neuroglia cells. The oligodendrocytes, the microglia, the astrocytes. All of these other cells, is, all of these other elements, it's a stroma. The liver has many functions. The liver processes nutrients, uh, synthesis of chlorine factors, synthesis of uh, most of the proteins in your body, detoxification of most of the chemicals that you enter your body. Okay? The liver does that. But the cells that do that are the hepatocytes. Only the hepatocytes do this, which are little cuboidal cells. But around them, I have biliary tubes, I have capillaries and veins, I have fibroblasts supporting, I have a mesh of fibers giving shape to the liver. So the hepatocytes is the parenchyma, all of the others are the stroma. No, you don't like that, huh? No. But why not? Because I feel like I'm gonna get to the sense and they're gonna say something, they're gonna be there, but like, I don't get it. 
Why is it that you don't get it? I don't see. Why is it that you don't get it? I don't see. Do you like this sport? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it either. Or this decent example? say parenchyma is what performs the primary function of the tissue or the organ. The primary function. The main function. The stroma is anything else that helps. That supports. Will, will hepatocytes be able to do all they do without the support of the, of the biliary system or the, the, the macrophages that are there or all of the other things? No, they can't. They still do it, they do it, but they need the help of the other cells, parenchyma and stroma. In, let me give another example. Tumors of the central nervous system, either malignant or benign. Tumors are increased proliferation, right? Proliferation out of control? 99%, most of the time, these tumors involve the stroma are gliomas. Why? Because the neurons cannot do mitosis. But in some other organs, the tumor can involve the stroma also. Okay? Because those are the cells that are constantly undergoing. In the case of the central nervous system, the neurons cannot go through mitosis. They can. In, in the myocardial, you are never, probably never going to have a tumor of the myocardium. Why? Because I don't go through mitosis. Okay. But you can have a tumor of fibroids in the uterus, right? What does that mean? This is fibrous tissue. Okay? Stroma parenchyma. Parenchyma is, is the main. I'm not saying the other ones are not important. But this is the one that does what the organ is recognized for. Okay? Or the system is recognized for. No problem. Any other question there? Yes. For this one? Yes. Um, I think so for LIBOR, when we have to know that if the epithelial cells, stomach, intestine, and then stable liver cells or hepatocytes in a permanent neuron myocardial cells? Yes. Okay. What was that example? Yes. You know the definitions? Uh, stable is normally stopped dividing when growth ceases. So stable cells don't divide. Don't you know? <laughs> the reason to give a name like that is hopefully the name tells you what it is. You know what? How do you pronounce? What is the right pronunciation for this? I don't know. I don't. I really don't know. I will make up a, 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 a pronunciation. But you speak English, right? Some of you, at least. So, somebody. I say bio. Probably wrong. That's so interesting about English, right? It's so interesting about English. Spanish is very phonetic. That's a big advantage. I mean, you can relation it with the insurance of the car, because there's something called la liability. That's not spelled the same. No, it's not the same. Not no, the same. it's similar, but it's not the same. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I don't know. Labile, or lay, whatever you pronounce it, is the opposite of rigid. Is the opposite of fixed. Fixed is not liable. Plasticity. Excuse me? Uh, it's in English. Okay. Might be wrong. Might be wrong. Yeah. The point is this. Plasticity is another term. When you hear something is very plastic, not, you're not talking about an object. You're talking about a dancer. Is the plasticity of the movements. It's not fixed, it's, it's changing, it's labile. That's how you say it. Labile? She said it, yeah. Labile. See? <laughs> Somebody has the same opinion. No, it's because I read through it, okay? I need to learn by memory these terms. Labile means not fixed. So these cells 
are not fixed. They are continuously going through mitosis. You know what this means? Then this means what? They cannot go through mitosis. Okay? Yes. Is that okay now? Yes. Can we move on or do we have any more questions? So no questions? So we move to the next one. Okay. What is the next one? What is the question? Is it here? Yeah. Oh, the other one. That's right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But the only question I had is if we had to go really in depth or just know like malnutrition, like it would be like. Oh, this so, one. Like, is yeah. it just asking for the definitions or? So, <laughs> I mentioned in class repair, healing is a metabolically demanding process, right? You need a lot of. ATP, nutrients, mitosis is going on. So it requires a lot of, it's a very demanding process. So anything that, anything that impairs this process or that decreases the availability of resources will increase that. So I have either general malnutrition, systemic malnutrition, that means low protein levels. You know, the, the most expensive part of our diet is proteins. Sugars are really cheap. So usually that's not a problem. The problem is we don't have enough proteins in our diet, so if we are deficient on that. Or maybe local. What if I have decreased blood supply? Or what if I have an infection? Or what if I have, you know, and that's all I'm saying. See, what it is. I mean, these and these are related, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, this is mean systemic, right? This means localized to the area. And of course, I mean, ischemia is what? Decrease blood flow, so decrease blood flow resulting to this, right? Yeah. And of course, what is the first step out of the three steps of the healing process? The, inflammatory the inflammation, right? And the inflammation is so strongly associated with what are the three effects of complement activation? And inflammation, right? So when the immune system is depressed, your inflammation is going to be depressed, and the healing process is going to be slowed down. Because we said inflammation is the first stage. It's the one that prepares the area for healing, right? And tries to limit the, the injury area and so on. Again, of course, an infection. What if I have a poor uh, uh, alignment? You know, when you have a surgery, and you cut through the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, and then the peritoneum, for example, see you're going into the peritoneal cavity, when the surgeon goes and closes, right, they need to close it by planes. They don't just do one, right? What is the purpose of that? Increase the chances of proper healing. Increase the chances of healing, of repair. So you align the two peritoneal layer. What if the subcutaneous tissue is too thick? They even may can make sometimes two layers there to make try to have a good uh, alignment, okay? And that's what this means, okay? You have any any foreign body? You have debris. You have uh, something that was left there, not on purpose, but you know you have a. You have a contaminated uh, wound, for example, see? And the cleaning is not good enough, the deprivement, and there are some little pebbles or something that stays there. That will slow down the process of healing, okay? That's all it means, so that you go through all of the elements, okay? okay. So now we're going into? Oh, okay.
Oh, did you, you have a message about tomorrow's, right? Tomorrow's session? I put a, a message on Blackboard. It's gonna to be tomorrow at 10 in downstairs, E119. This is A119. A119 is downstairs. It's just right downstairs. Okay, tomorrow at 10, 10 to 11, 15 more or less. Because I have class at 11. Yes, go ahead. So for number three, um, so it comes to that one. Do you, under humoral, and I think almost all of them, there's like subsections. Do you want us to know all of them? See, when you talk about pathology or pathophysiology, right? How would, what would be the main difference between B cell or T cell deficiencies or combined deficiencies about the pathophysiology? Is it affecting only the cells? Only T cells or both, right? And you remember, B cells are primarily effective against extracellular antigens, right? T cells are very good against intracellular antigens. So what are the most obvious intracellular pathogens? Viruses. Viruses, of course. So are B cells gonna be good at fighting viral infections? No, but T cells are. A good number of fungal infections result in intracellular problems, so that's the T cells. Typically, again, T cells tend to be more common. Another thing that I mentioned, B cells are usually just the immune problem, B cell abnormalities. But T cells, because it involves a thymus, as I said, the immunodeficiency in conditions affecting the T cells, the immunodeficiency is just part of the problem. They have a lot of other problems, neurological problems, respiratory problems, other very serious conditions. And I didn't go in details on that, but that's a big difference. Typically, T cell or severe combined deficiencies are much more serious. What's gonna be the most common problem with B cell deficiencies in general? And, and GI. And GI, because that's, because antibodies protect your mucous membranes, right? That is the, a very common condition associated with them, okay? Autoimmune diseases and hypersensitivity, right? Okay. Yes. Can somebody try? So, uh, louder, please, so she can. Yeah. And MHC is what makes you you you. So, what is the rationale trying to match them? Trying to decrease the chances of rejection, increase the chances of acceptance. Yeah. Should I remove that objective? Maybe I should, huh? Excuse me? It's not about the test, it's about the learning. Who cares about the grade? <laughs> it's the learning that is important. My GPA cares about the grade. Oh, come on. <laughs> Nobody will ask you for the GPA. No, I know. Any questions? Go ahead. Um, so, that one was when uh, the tissue rejects 
and usually what is needed, what is required for this to happen. This is a situation in which a transplanted tissue, a graft, reacts against the host, right? When is this gonna happen? One, typically the host is immunodepressed. Two, obviously, the transplanted tissue contains immune elements, right? Of course, the obvious example would be, why what if I receive a bone marrow transplant? I'm receiving lymphocytes, of course, right? From another individual. But that's not always the case. Because if I receive, I don't know, let's say a liver transplant, I might still have in the liver lymphocytes from the donor. And these lymphocytes might be able to recognize my MHC as foreign, bind to them, and produce an inflammatory response. Okay, that's pretty much what it is. It depends, of course, you know, so when you see the manifestations, what is in a very simplistic way? How do you know a tissue transplant, whatever that transplant was, is being rejected? When are you going to suspect that? Is it along the heart, the liver, the kidney, whatever? The organ is not functioning right? You evaluate the function of the organ, right? And that's one question. The second question is, what do you think is, in general, in a very basic level, the basic, basic mechanism of this? See, what is happening? How? What is the result? What is the mechanism of this attack? Excuse me? Inflammation. That's what it is. And inflammation is? Right? You know the four, right? But that's happening in your transplanted tissue. And as you have inflammation, you might have cell injury, right? Because of the potential lysis and phagocytosis. And of course, because of that, you're gonna have reduced function. So when we say attack or rejection, that's what it means. Then we know the mechanism. Can be antibody based, right? Or can be T cell based, but most of the times transplant rejection is T cells. And I'm talking about T cytotoxic cells, right? Is there a difference between the host versus that? Like the host? It's the conditions of the host, usually, okay? That, and, and most of the times, actually, some, I was reading somewhere, I don't know, somebody was telling me. More and more physicians or research or, or doctors are trying to not completely destroy the immune system of the of the recipient. Yes, what is the potential problem with that? One, you might have a stronger rejection, right? But at least you reduce the chances of this reaction because you have some defense against it. Okay. No, it, this is the acute and chronic disease just for the transplants in general, which is uh, it's close to the end, right? Yes. So, but remember we mentioned here that the term acute has a different meaning here, right? Yes. We are not talking about hours or, 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 or uh, days. We are talking about at least weeks. You know the four types of hypersensitivity mechanisms, right? You know the actual mechanism, the names and the numbers, and you have examples of each. You can distinguish alloimmunity, autoimmunity, allergy. We went through that. Okay. Um, going back to the number three, when we have number what? Number six. Okay. You need to know the general mechanism of IG. What is it? See, and if I give you an example, either a natural example like hay fever or a mechanism described, you need to recognize it as IG as a type one. It's type one when the main problem is IgE and the granulation of mast cells, right? That is the main problem in type one. And typically, again, type one is a typical allergy. 
Autoimmunity is when, for different reasons, potential reasons, your immune system fails to recognize self and unself. So autoimmunity is lack of self-tolerance, okay? So when I have a self-transplant, autologous transplant, it means I'm receiving a tissue from myself. Blood doping, for example, see? I collect some blood, I store it, I save it, and then I receive my blood back in what, one week or two weeks or whatever. It's my same tissue, right? That's not a problem at all. When you talk about allo, is another individual, is another individual. And that is actually the most common type of transplant, right? It's the most common. What are the chances of success? It depends on the degree of matching between the MHC. The closer the MHC is, the better the chances. Right? Autoimmunity, alloimmunity. What do we call allergy? When the reaction is to an environmental antigen. And something from the environment, maybe associated with plants, with insects, with fruits, a molecule from the environment dust, you know, whatever, turf, parasites, you name it. Yes? No. Okay, good. There is something, for example, that term is not used that much because it's not very, very popular, but more than few people try, see, the type of transplant, we understand this, right? This is the most common type of transplant. You understand this, right? You understand this. There is something called a xenograft. Xeno means foreign. Xenograft, X-E-N-O. A xenograft is the case of a transplant from a different species. They have tried liver transplant, I, they tried one some years ago, uh, as I remember correctly, from, from a baboon, a primate, to a human. Of course, they are gonna be very antigenic. We are more and more different, right? You know, of course, about, I guess you heard, I don't really heard about the efforts of developing uh, transgenic pigs for the potential use as heart donors. This effort has been going on for a good number of years and a good amount of resources have been developed trying to develop, trying to grow pigs that are not very antigenic or are less antigenic. So to increase the chances of a successful tr heart transplant. See, they, these pigs have been grown in sterile conditions from the time of fertilization, trying to eliminate any other virus 